Hello, this is Brother Samuel, and today we're going to uh, address more of the uh, fallacy of those who uh, misinterpret scripture and uh, the ignorance that is involved with this whole process uh, that contribute to uh, to these misinterpretation of scripture passages uh, that leads to uh, confusion division among believers uh, it is important that we as believers test all things uh, with the Word of God to validate whether or not if it is substantiated with the written Word of God even when when we are uh, confronted with a uh, sermon, a message, an explanation of a passage, uh, we should uh, patiently uh, investigate and study and research um, uh, with an open mind of that passage until uh, we come to the realization of what is actually communicated rather than taking uh, somebody's word for it and allowing ourselves to be walked like dogs um, I would like to reiterate that I have uh, constructed a number of videos uh, dealing with uh, the believers eternal security or in short once saved always saved and in those videos I give a substantial amount of evidence and proof from the Word of God that the believer's salvation um, is secure in Christ and therefore cannot be lost again however uh, there are those who are on the other side of the table um, who profess a Christianity uh, that believe that you can lose your salvation and such people are opponents uh, to the doctrine of eternal security or in short when saved always saved uh, they notoriously and vigorously go to various different verses to try to prove that the doctrine of eternal security is uh, a false doctrine and however what we want to look at is we want to address some of these passages uh, to see exactly if these passages are saying that we can lose our salvation um, we want to examine these passages to see if that's the case or are these passages being misinterpreted and so the Bible tells us in Proverbs 4 and 7 it says get wisdom for it is the principal thing however with all your getting get an understanding amen and um, let us uh, look at two different theological terms that are given to define two different methods method of interpreting the scripture and one is called exegesis and one is called eisegesis and eisegesis is the approach to Bible interpretation where the interpreter tries to force the Bible to mean something that fits their existing belief or understanding of a particular issue or doctrine People who interpret the Bible this way are usually not willing to let the Bible speak for itself and let the chips fall where they may. They start off with an upfront goal of trying to prove a point they already believe in. And everything they read and interpret is filtered through that paradigm or that fixed mindset. 
or that preconceived mindset. Stated another way, they engage in what the Bible calls or refers to as a private interpretation. Exegesis is the process of approaching the Bible, approaching Bible interpretation with a humble spirit and an open mind in order to gain a true understanding of God's word. One must be willing to allow God's word to speak for itself and be willing to abandon cherished beliefs if they are in conflict with God's word. Proper exegesis includes using the context around the verse, comparing it with other parts of the Bible or other verses from the Bible and applying an understanding of the language and customs of the time of the writing in an attempt to understand clearly what the original writer intended to convey. In, or, in other words, it is trying to pull out of the passage the meaning inherent in it. I repeat, the opposite of exegesis is eisegesis, which is a person's particular interpretation of scripture uh, that, are, that are not evident in the text itself. As my dad often say, if you come to the Bible with a preconceived mindset, with a preconceived bias, a preconceived prejudice, uh, you will learn nothing new because you already have your mind made up about what you believe. Amen. There are those who are opponents to the biblical doctrine, the believer's eternal security. They employ a number of verses to try to prove a believer can lose his or her salvation. Such people also say that though salvation is a gift, I want you to pay attention to this. Such people also say though salvation is a gift, you still have to earn it through good works or by keeping the law of Moses. Let's flip over to Acts chapter 15, uh, uh, verses uh, 1 and 2. And let's, let's address this way of thinking. Let's address this way of thinking to see if the Bible validate this way of thinking. To see if the Bible supports this way of thinking. <clears throat> um, let me read this again before we read Acts 15, 1 and 2. Such people who believe that you can lose your salvation... Such people who believe that you have to do something in order to earn your salvation. Mm -hmm. Such people also say that though salvation, though salvation is a gift, you still have to earn it through good works. Mm. Or by keeping the law of Moses. Now, let's look at Acts 15, and let's examine the language of Acts 15 to see if the Bible supports such a notion. It says in verse 1 and 2, it says, And certain men which came down from Judea taught the brethren and said, Except ye be circumcised, except ye be circumcised after the manner of Moses, ye cannot be saved. Certain men came to the Gentile believers, amen, who impose um, the requirement of circumcision and the law of Moses as a basis for salvation on the Gentile believers. Now let's see how Paul responded to this. Let's see if Paul was in agreement with this, this notion. 
it says in verse 2, it says, When therefore Paul and Barnabas see, had no small dissensions or argument and disputations, that means debate, with them, mm, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem unto the apostles and elders about this question. Apparently, Paul and Barnabas didn't agree with this belief. Mm. Now, let's go down to verse 4 of Acts 15. It says, And when they were come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and of the apostles and I emphasize the apostles and the elders and they declared all the things that God had done with them now note what verse 5 says but there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees which believed many of the Pharisees who had came out of Judaism uh, into a faith in Jesus Christ and it continues to read it say, and this is this is what they were saying saying that it was needful or that it was necessary to circumcise them the Gentiles and to command them to keep the law of Moses mm. let's read on in verse 6 and the apostles and the elders hmm, came together for to consider this matter. Verse 7. And when there had been much dis disputing or debate, Paul, uh, Peter arose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, ye know how that a good while ago God made choice among us that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Hear the word of the gospel and believe. It didn't say hear the word of the law and believe. It says hear the word of the gospel and believe. Mm. Now note what verse 8 says. And Peter is still talking. And God which knoweth the hearts. Mm, bear them witness. Giving them the Holy Ghost even as he did unto us. Hmm. Now, if anybody is studious in Scripture, you know that Romans 8 and 9 says that he that hath not the Spirit of Christ is not of his. And Peter is clearly conveying that the Gentiles receive the gift of the Holy Ghost through the hearing of faith, through the hearing of the gospel of Jesus Christ. When they heard the message of Jesus Christ and believed from their heart, they were sealed with the Holy Ghost. They were given the Holy Ghost. Mm. <clears throat> and in verse 9 Peter continues and put no difference between us and them mm. purifying their hearts by faith in other words they didn't have the law yet they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ and believed it and God gave them the Holy Ghost even as he gave the Holy Ghost to us you see Purifying their hearts, cleansing their hearts by faith, you see. And then it says in verse 10, it says, Now therefore, why tip ye God? Why tip ye God? Mm. Peter is saying, why tip ye God in relationship to these Pharisees who want to impose circumcision, who wants to impose uh, keeping the law of Moses and bear in mind it's not just Ten Commandments it is 613 ordinances that came with the law that God gave to Moses 613 ordinances mm. and they are saying that the Gentiles have to keep it in order to be saved hmm and Peter said, such a notion 
would be to tempt God. You see. Now, listen to what he says here. Let me read on. Verse 10. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke or a burden upon the neck of the disciples? Which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear. Mm. He reminds them that our fathers, our forefathers, we have the history of we have the scriptures. We have Moses and the prophets. Amen. We have proof and evidence that our fathers were not able to keep the law. They failed miserably at keeping the law. And not only did our fathers fail, but we ourselves had, have failed. Mm -hmm. We have failed. Let me read that one more time. It says, now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Mm. Mm. And then it says in verse 11, it says, but we believe. But we believe what? But we believe that through grace. Grace? We believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. You see, we Jews are saved through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ as also the Gentiles. Mm. Amen. You see it? So this is not a new argument, my friend. This argument was put before the, uh, the early church, the church in its infant stages. In its initial beginning. Mm. This was a constant. Uh, 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 thorn in the early church's side. Because you always had men. Uh, who were trying to bring uh, uh, the Christian believers. Under the law. Mm. Make them obligated to the law in order to receive salvation. Mm. And so we see that Paul and Barnabas apparently didn't have that understanding and didn't agree with it. Therefore, we can't go to that. We can't go to Paul's epistles, the two third that he wrote in the New Testament by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and conclude that Paul put emphasis on keeping the law in order to be saved. When we have clear evidence right here in Acts 15 that Paul opposed that very notion. So therefore, we must be in. We must be those of you that reject was saved, always saved, Amen. That were saved uh, by grace through faith alone, apart from works, Amen. Those who oppose that and try to go to Paul's epistles to prove that you have to uh, work and you have to keep the law uh, in order to be saved or to earn salvation. You are misinterpreting those verses. Mm. Because Paul right here in this document, document right here, in this documentation of Paul's actions here, he is clearly opposed to that whole notion. So I, I would implore you to go read his epistles with an open mind. Instead of coming to the word with a preconceived mindset, with a mindset that is already made up. On what it believes. And trying to force. That belief into passages. That is clearly not saying what you believe. Mm. Mm. Glory to God. In heaven. Amen. Now. Praise the Lord. Let's read on down to round about. Uh, the 11th verse. It says right here in verse 11. But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ we shall be saved even as they are. Jump down to verse 24 and watch this. For as much as, and this is this is this is after they had concluded that that the that the Gentile believers was not required to be circumcised in order to be saved. They were not required to keep the law of Moses. Amen. Which consisted of 613 laws. 
in order to be saved. And so they sent men down to the Gentile believers to assure them that what they had been told uh, was not, uh, the men were not sent from them. They had not approved the word that they had been trying to proclaim to the Gentiles. These Pharisees who had become believers, who was putting emphasis on law keeping in order to be saved, uh, they sent letters with certain men, amen, designated men to go down and to confirm that that word was not from us. And it says in verse 24, it says, For as much as he, as much as we have heard that certain which went down from us have troubled you with words, subverting your souls, that means misleading your hearts, amen, saying ye must be circumcised and keep the law, he says, to whom we gave no such commandments. To whom we gave so to whom we gave no such commandments. So we see that the early church, the apostles and the elders in the early church, Paul and Barnabas, stood vigorously against this whole notion that law keeping was a requirement or necessity for salvation. Mm. Amen. Are you seeing it? Mm. Thank you, Jesus. There it is right there. So we see that the Bible don't support this notion as such people would have you to think, you see. Hallelujah. Now, one of the verses these poor, uh, misinformed souls employ to prove you have to earn your salvation and that you can lose your salvation is 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 27. Let's go look at that and see if that be the case. Again, when you interpret a verse, you can't go to one word in a verse and then build a doctrine on one word. You can't go to one verse and build a doctrine on one verse. You have to take into consideration the context around the verse. Mm. And then it's good also to take in consideration the content in the verse. Amen. And then compare it to other parts of the Bible, other verses that is bearing on the same subject. Amen. And that's very important uh, to know uh, and to understand if you're going to make an attempt to interpret the word of God. Amen. Glory to God in heaven. And I repeat Proverbs 4 and 7. Get wisdom for it is the principal thing. But with all your getting, get an understanding. Get an understanding, my friend. Hallelujah. So let's. Flip over to 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and see if that verse, if that verse teaches that you have to earn your salvation, or if that verse teaches that you can lose your salvation. Let's see if that's the case, you see. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, uh, verse 27 is the verse that they use, and verse 24 that they use are employed to say that you can lose your salvation and that you have to do something in order to earn your salvation. Let's see if that's the case. Let's see if that is what Paul was saying. We just clearly saw in Acts chapter 15 that Paul stood uh, in a position of opposition to the whole idea of keeping the law in order to be saved, in order to receive salvation. We just saw that in Acts 15. Clear as water, plain as James. All righty. Now, let's read verse 27. It says, But I keep under my body, Paul is referring to himself, and bring it into subjection, or under control, or submission, least by any means when I have preached, and, and that word preached is very important, to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now, let's go over to verse 24. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race 
all uh, but one, listen, but one receiveth the prize. So run ye that ye may obtain. That ye may obtain. Mm. Note the word castaway. They based their whole interpretation on these two words. Castaway and the word prize. You see. Somehow they think that the word prize implies salvation. Amen. Let's look at uh, Ephesians chapter 2 right quick. And then we'll come back and look at this in light of Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 and verse 9. <clears throat> Remember, compare scripture with scripture. Amen. If you don't do that, if you interpret a, a, a verse apart from its context or, or without consideration of scripture as a whole, you will find yourself coming up with an interpretation of a verse that will be in clear contradiction of other passages in the Bible. And it causes the Bible or it... Uh, causes the Bible to sound as if it's contradicting itself when really the contradiction is the one the contradiction is with the one who is interpreting it not the Bible amen <laughs> glory to God in heaven so over in Ephesians 2 8 and 9 now we need to understand uh, uh, salvation we need to understand it and one of the verses that really gives us uh, an insight into salvation and gives us a sense of what salvation is, is Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And this is what it says. It says, for by grace are ye saved. So we see that grace, which is God's unmerited favor, his undeserved kindness, God extends his grace, amen, uh, uh, to, to those of us who, who hear the message of Jesus Christ, his atoning death, and his resurrection, and put Faith in that atoning death and that resurrection. God extends his grace to us. Amen. God gives us repentance and forgiveness through that grace, my friend. Listen to what it says. It says, for by grace are ye saved through faith, you see. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, it's very important for you to understand that salvation is being conveyed here in the context of a gift. Your paycheck is not a gift. You earned your paycheck. It's not a gift. See. The moment I think. Or get the notion that I have to do something. In order to receive the free gift of grace. Amen. Then it is no longer a gift anymore. Hmm. You see. However, the scripture conveys that salvation is a gift. And what constitutes a gift is you can't do anything to earn it and you can't do anything to deserve it. God gives us grace as a free gift. It is called the gift of God in this passage. And in verse 9 it says, Not of works, not of effort, lest any man should boast. Mm. So if salvation is a gift, let's go back and, and look at uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and uh, verse 27 and 24 again. And let's, let's, let's examine it in light of Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. And Paul was the one who wrote Ephesians 2, uh, 8 and 9. He also wrote 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 9, verse 27 and 22. And and apparently he can't be he can't be saying two opposites. And that would make him double minded, my friend, and unreliable. You see, it says in verse twenty seven, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, least by any means when I have preached to others I myself may become a castaway. Verse twenty four says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run. All but one receive the prize, so run that ye may obtain. Again, in verse 24, Paul uh, uh, 
is in my, admonishing the believers to run. He using the analogy of of, 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 a, of of a marathon, of a race. Those who run in a race are in order to obtain a prize, but only one can receive the prize. And we should run in such a way that we want to that we want to that we want to please the Lord. Amen. And it's important to note that Paul is not talking about salvation in this chapter. This salvation. In this chapter, salvation in, is not even mentioned. It's not even talked about in this chapter. Paul is not trying to get anybody saved in this chapter. Everybody in this chapter that he's writing to the Corinthians is the church, number one. They're already saved. Amen. And Paul is referring to Christian works. Amen. And not Christian salvation amen and we're going to see that as we continue to examine these passages in light of the scripture as a whole so a prize is something that you win mm. a prize is something that you win it is not a gift you can't put prize and gift in the same category they are two separate realities a prize is something that someone earned. And so they bestow the prize up on him because he did something to earn it or to deserve it. A gift is clearly taught. Amen. The Bible clearly teaches that we are saved by grace and that salvation is a gift of God. It's not a prize, my friend. Therefore, Paul is not talking about prize. In, in the context of salvation. Mm. He's talking about rewards. In the context of Christian service. Amen. And we're going to see that as we continue to, to look into this passage. Amen. Let's look at. A, I want to read again Ephesians 2 and 8. But I want to read it from the New uh, Living Translation Bible. And it says in verse 8. It says God saved you by his grace when you believed. You see. When you believed, and you can't take credit for this, it is a gift from God. Mm. Verse 9 says, salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done, you see. So none of us can boast about it. Mm. Let us deal with the word castaway. And let me let me let me pose two questions at this point. Is Paul referring to losing salvation? Or is Paul referring to Christian works not being accepted by the Lord when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ? Mm. Let me let me ask those two questions again. The first question is is Paul referring to that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 27 excuse me, chapter uh, 9, verse 27, when he refers to the word castaway, least I should become a castaway, is he talking about losing salvation? Or is he talking about, listen to this, Christian works not being accepted by the Lord when he or any believer stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Hmm. All right, let's look at let's look at what Jesus said about uh, 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 the believer's salvation. Let's go over to John chapter uh, six, verse thirty-seven, and let's think about this in light of what we're reading in First Corinthians chapter nine, verse twenty-seven. Let's go over to John chapter six, thirty-seven. Listen to what Jesus said. If this don't convey eternal security. I don't know what does. Amen. Glory to God in heaven. In 37 it says. John chapter 6 verse 37. All that the father giveth me. Listen. All that the father giveth me. Shall come to me. Listen. All that the father giveth me. Shall come to me. All that the Father giveth me giveth to me shall come to me. Watch this. And him that cometh, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast him out. 
I will in no wise cast him out. All that come to me, Jesus said, I will in no wise cast him out. Mm. See, we have to interpret scripture in light of scripture. You see, don't just take one verse and take one word out of a verse and then assume and then base an interpretation on an assumption. Mm. Amen. Your interpretation will be flawed every single time. <laughs> Glory to God in heaven. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Mm. All that the Father giveth me, I should, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. Therefore, Paul couldn't have been referring to losing his salvation. Paul couldn't have been talking about losing his salvation. My friend, that would have been in direct conflict with the words of the Lord Jesus himself. Mm. Amen. For the sake of clarity, let me read that again. John 6 and 37. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast him out. Mm. The Father gives us to the Son. And all of us that comes to the Son for salvation. The Son said, he will in no wise cast us out. Amen. Glory to God in heaven. That's a promise, my friend. And it's coming from the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. Now, how can Paul be preaching something that goes completely against the grain of what Jesus said? Apparently, it's not Paul here who is saying that you can lose your salvation. It's the way you're interpreting that verse. You see. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God in heaven. Let me, let, me, let me give you another. Let me reiterate again the definition of eisegesis. So that we can get some clarity on what's going on here. Eisegesis is the, the approach to Bible interpretation. Where the interpreter tries to force. The Bible to mean something that fits their existing belief or understanding of a particular issue or doctrine. People who interpret the Bible this way are usually not willing to let the Bible speak for itself and let the chips fall where they may. They start off with the upfront goal of trying to prove a point they already believe in and everything they read and interpret is filtered through this paradigm or this preconceived mindset. Mm -hmm. Stated another way, they engage in what the Bible refers to as a private interpretation. Amen. Let's continue to examine uh, this passage to see even more evidence that this verse or this passage in no way is conveying that a believer can lose his or her salvation. That is something that is read or forced into the text. It's not even in the text. It's being forced into the text by those who reject the message of grace. Those who say that they believe in the message of grace. And then they refer you to the law in order to be saved. They put emphasis on good works in order to deserve salvation. That's a contradiction, my friend. That's what you call a double-minded person. And you know what James said about a double-minded person? He is unstable in all of his ways. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. Well, that may explain what that may explain why so many folks' prayers are not being answered. <laughs> Glory to God in heaven. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Let's go on. Mm. Now, the word castaway is the same as reject. It's the same as reject. Amen. And see, let's, let's, let's look at it. Let's look at it uh, in light of uh, the Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament words. Again, the word castaway is the same as rejected. Paul Paul 
is referring to Christian works not being accepted by the Lord when he stands be when he stands before the judgment seat of Christ and not losing his salvation. Amen. Now, over in the Vines Expository Dictionary of New Testament words, um, the word uh, the word that is employed is an adjective, and it's pronounced a document. A document. And this is what it means. It signifies not standing the test. You see. It signifies rejected. Watch this now. Tested or approved. Watch this now. Read on. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verse 7. Cast away or rejected. Disapproved. And so rejected. From present testimony. Pay attention to this last statement. With loss of future rewards. With loss of future rewards. Mm. See. So the word castaway here is being used in the context of rewards that will be allotted to believers for their service in Christ. You see. Amen. And so let's examine another passage of scripture. That will communicate and convey this, amen, even more so, with great simplicity and clarity. Amen. Let's, let's, let's bag up to 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and let's get a sense of the whole text. So that we can understand that the thrust is not about you earning your salvation. The thrust of the text is not about you losing your salvation. But Paul is talking about the rights of Christian ministers. And he's talking about the fact that Christian ministers will be rewarded. Amen. Not only for their service in this life. Amen. But in the life to come. Okay, let's examine this. Let's begin. Glory to God in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. Let's go over to uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses uh, 1 uh, through 4. Watch this now. Am I not an apostle? Why is Paul asking such pointed questions about his apostleship? As if his apostleship is being challenged. Let's read on. Am I not an apostle? Have I, am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Are not we work? Are you are, are not ye my work in the Lord? He's talking to the church at Corinth and he's saying, Are you not my proof in the Lord? You are my work in the Lord. You are the byproduct of my work. You are saved because of my God appointed ministry. It was through my preaching that you came into the knowledge of his grace and believed and was sealed with the Holy Ghost. That's what Paul is saying to these Corinthians. Why do he feel a need to, to come at them in such a way? Well, let's examine. Verse 2 says, if, if I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you. If I'm not sent to nobody else, I'm sent to you. Watch this now. For ye, he says, for, for the seal of my apostleship are ye in the Lord. You see that right there? You are the proof of my apostleship. You are the proof that I have been sent from God. You are now in the faith. Because of my preaching. Because of my Christian service. Amen. Glory to God in heaven. And he reads in verse 4. Have ye not power to have we not power to eat and to drink? In other words, we get hungry and thirsty too. You see. Mm-hmm. And then it says in verse 5, it says, Have we not power to, to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles? And as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas, which is Peter, are I, I only and Barnabas have, have not the power to forbear working. You see, verse 7 says, Who goeth to a warfare at any time at his own charge? In other words, what soldier go to war for a country 
and that country don't uh, uh, compensate him for his services. You see. You see that right there? This is not about losing your salvation, my friend. This is about the right of ministers to be compensated for their services. Amen. Let's read on. Who planted a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? You see. You see that right there? I mean, if you plant a garden, don't you partake of what you plant in the garden? Amen. If you feed a flock, don't you don't you partake of what that flock can give back to you? It can give you milk. It can give you cheese. It can give you meat. It can give you clothing. Come on now. Amen. And then it says in verse 8, Say I these things as a man, question, or saith not the law the same also. In other words, the law of God, Amen. Conveys the fact that that the ministers of Christ have a right to be compensated for their services. You see. Now watch this now. And it says in verse 9, and he quotes Deuteronomy chapter 25 verse 4. And again, he's not quoting Deuteronomy 25 verse 4 as a basis for salvation, but as a basis to support the fact that Christian ministers have a right to be supported by the body of Christ. Financially so. You see. That's what he's talking about here my friend. Let's read verse 9. It says. For as it is written in the law of Moses. Thou shalt not muzzle the ox. Uh, the mouth of the ox that treaded out the corn. Doeth God take care of the oxen? Or hath he said it all together for our sakes? For our sakes no doubt. This is written. That he that that he that that he that plow should plow in hope, and that he that thrusted in hope should be partaker of 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 his hope. And then it says, in, it asks some pointed questions here, rhetorical questions here, common sense questions in verse eleven. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, if my preaching and my teaching has been a blessing to you spiritually, if your life has been been, been greatly enhanced and enriched through my preaching and teaching. Come on now. That's what Paul is talking about when he says, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Or if you somehow you know, feed us and clothe us and provide us with a place to stay? You see. Or you become altogether a source of income for us? Amen. As those that are watching over your soul, souls. Amen. That's what Paul is talking about right here, my friend. And then it says in verse uh, 12, it says, If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather nevertheless we have not used this power or this right, but suffered all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Suffered all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of, our, of Christ. In other words, if you go, if you have a problem with us uh, receiving from you, from your material possessions, from your carnal possessions, then we rather not receive anything if it's going to hinder you in the gospel. Mm. Now watch this now. <clears throat> in verse thirteen, it says, "But ye, uh, do ye not know that uh, that they which minister about holy things?" Lived of the things of the temple. Now he's referring to the, Le the Le Levitical priesthood. The sons of Aaron. And how that the, the animal sacrifices. And, and the wheat sacrifices. And, and the crop, crops and all that. That was brought on an annual basis. To the storehouse to be stored. Uh, how that the priest. That became their portion. That was their portion. That supported them and their families. You see. You see. In other words what he's saying is that God hadn't changed the way that he supported his ministers. The law that he established. Uh, 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 to support his, his, his priesthood. Uh, under the law. Is the same law that is, uh, is, is set forth today in the new covenant of grace. Amen. 
that we should observe as it relates to those that God has appointed in the body of Christ as ministry gifts to teach us, to instruct us uh, in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what Paul is talking about right here. And then he says in verse 14, watch this. Even so the Lord had ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. In other words, if, if, if a, a plumber, he makes his living through his plumbing skills. A lawyer makes his living through lawyer skills. A doctor makes his living through doctor skills. It's a, it's a no-brainer, you see. <laughs> Amen. Glory to God in heaven. And so I read again. Even so had the Lord ordained. Who ordained it? The Lord. That they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Should be supported through what they do. When, 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 when you employ an electrician to come to your house. You expect to receive a bill. Amen. When you go to the doctor's office, you, you expect to receive a bill. And you don't have a problem with, with, with them uh, presenting a bill to you because you understand that they have a right to be compensated for their services. That's what Paul is talking about right here, my friend. Amen. Glory to God in heaven. It's amazing how people can go to one word in a verse. And then, and then draw uh, uh, out of it an interpretation and then build a doctrine on that interpretation. And that interpretation goes against the whole grain of what that chapter is talking about. That is amazing to me. And yet people do it and, and they're doing it all the time. And many of you are aware of it, especially here on YouTube. Uh, it's notorious on here. Amen. Hallelujah. So, again, let's read on to uh, verse 15. It says, But I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it is better for me to die. It is better for me to die. I would rather die than that any man should make my glory in vain. You see. In other words, I would rather not receive anything from you, amen, than to have someone going around saying that all I want is your money. Uh, Paul said, I would rather die first. Amen. Glory to God. Now watch what it says in verse 16. It says, for though I preach the gospel, now notice, he says, though I preach. He's talking about a good work, you see. He says, I have nothing to glory of. He says, for necessity is laid upon me. Though I preach the gospel, necessity is laid upon me. Necessity is laid upon me? Paul is simply saying that I have needs. Mm. Watch this now. For, for necessity is laid upon me. He said, yeah, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Mm. Nevertheless, woe unto me if I preach not the gospel. Now, notice what it says in verse 17 and 18. He says, For if I do this thing willingly, of my own free will, I have a reward. You see that word reward? See, Paul is not talking about salvation, my friend. He's talking about rewards, amen, that will be allotted to the believers for their Christian service. Amen. A day is coming when we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to be judged according to everything that we have done in our bodies, good and bad. And it's important to understand that that judgment is not a judgment of condemnation. It is a judgment to determine the measure of your rewards. Amen. And we're going to look at that and we're going to see that. Amen. Now, let me begin at verse 17 for the sake of clarity. It says, for we, for if I do this willingly of my own free will, I have a reward. But if I, but, but if against my will, 
a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. Mm. Amen. It says in verse 18, what is what is my reward? Now, now, now underline that word reward. There it is again. Salvation is not a what? It's not a reward, my friend. Paul is not talking about a reward. It says in Ephesians 2 and 8 that salvation is by grace through faith. It says that salvation is a gift of God. A gift of God, my friend. Not of works. Amen. It says, verse 18, What is my reward then, verily, or truly, is that when I preached the gospel, I, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge. In other words, I don't ask for nothing. I don't expect anything. But you ought to have common sense. You see. <laughs> Amen. That I abuse not my power in the gospel. You see. See, Paul is talking about rewards for Christian service. He's not talking about salvation. Amen. And so that's very important to note. Amen. When you read these passages, glory to God in heaven. So let's uh, look over here in uh, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And we're going to begin around the fifth verse. Amen. And we're going to read down to verse 15 because we get a glimpse into uh, the believer's judgment when, when the believer stands before the judgment seat of Christ. And this judgment is not about the believer's uh, condemnation, but it's about uh, the measure of the believer's eternal reward in Christ based on their good and bad works. And so let's go look at that and examine that and get a glimpse into that. And this all coincides with Paul, with what Paul is saying over in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. You see. It says in verse 5, it says, now let me give you a little a little commentary here on this. Uh, we have a situation where there is some, di some division in the church at Corinth. You know, and you got some saying, I'm of Paul and I'm of Apollos. Like today, they may say something like, well, I'm of the black Israelites and we got the truth and nobody else got the truth. Or they may say, well, uh, I'm of uh, of uh, Islam and we got the truth and I'm of uh, uh, oneness Pentecostal and we got the truth. I'm of Jehovah Witnesses and we got the truth. And, and we refer to our spiritual leaders as men of God who got the truth and as if nobody else got the truth, as if they got a monopoly on the truth. That's what's going on here, my friend. And Paul is addressing his foolishness right here. And he takes them all the way to their reward. Watch this now. He says in verse 5 of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he says, Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed? You came to a faith, a saving faith, in uh, Jesus Christ through their preaching, you see. Even as the Lord gave to every man. In other words, your salvation essentially is of the Lord. Regardless of the human instrument that God used to get your attention. It was God that saved you. You see. And then it says in verse 6, it says, I have planted. Paul say, I have planted. And Apollos have water. Talking about the work. The good work, my friend. He says, watch this. He says, but God gave the increase. In other words, God gave you salvation. Amen. He granted you salvation. Hallelujah. And then verse 7 says, So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. And verse 8 says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. They are one and the same. We belong to the same body. That is the body of Christ. It says, And every man shall receive his what? Reward. Not every man shall receive his salvation, but a reward. And a reward, again, is not a gift. And salvation is a gift. You see. And then it says, according to his own labor. You see that right there? And it says in verse 9, For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. You are his garden. You are the planting of the Lord. You see. Amen. He says, ye are God's building. In other words, you are his house. You are his tabernacle. 
He holds the title deed to your life. Glory to God in heaven. It is he alone who has saved you. Amen. And yet those whom God have employed, amen, to be utilized by his Holy Spirit to proclaim his message of grace into the hearing of your ears that you might believe, they will be rewarded for their works, you see. Glory to God in heaven. And then it says in verse 10, according to the grace of God, which is given to me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and, a, and, and another build that buildeth their own, and let every man take heed how he buildeth their own. Verse 11 says, for, uh, for other foundations can uh, no man lay, lay than that uh, is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In other words, he's the salvation of foundation. Amen. He's the sanctification foundation. You can't have salvation without Christ, and you can't be sanctified without Christ. You see. And it says in verse 12, it says, Now if any man build up on this foundation gold, pay attention to these this analogy here that Paul is given, these two different classifications of works. If any man build on this foundation gold, silver, and precious stones, that's the first classification. And then the second classification is wood, hay, and stubble. You see. Wood, hay, and stubble. Amen. Every man's work, there it is again, work, shall be made manifest or shall show up for what it really is at the judgment seat of Christ. That's what he's talking about. He says every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it because it shall be revealed by fire and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. Whether it is wood, stubble, or hay, or gold, silver, or precious stones. You see. In other words, if you put wood, stubble, and hay in fire. If you go out and you and you gather wood, stubble, and hay. You done put forth an effort. You done, you done worked and you done collected something. And if you put it in fire, it's consumed and you left with nothing. You left with nothing. What he's saying is that not everything that we have done in Jesus' name, not everything that we have done in our flesh is going to be accepted. There's not going to be any reward for it. Amen. That's what he's talking about here, my friend. Amen. We're not going to lose anything. We're just not going to gain anything. <laughs> Glory to God. And so he says with, uh, concerning the, uh, the gold, silver, and precious stones, my friend, He's talking about that which we do uh, as we collaborated with the Holy Spirit and his influence in our lives. Amen. Glory to God. In every aspect of our lives, that is classified as gold, silver, and uh, precious stones. And when you take those elements, those commodities, and you put them into fire, what happens? You come out with something that's more valuable. You come out with something that's even more valuable than what it was before you put it in the fire. You see. That's what he's talking about, my friend. Now watch this. He says right here in verse 14, it says, If any man's work abide, which he has built thou upon, talking about Jesus Christ, the foundation, he shall receive what? A reward. It's not talking about salvation, my friend. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Let's look at that one more time and we'll come back to this. And it says right here in verse uh, 16, 17, and 18. He says, For though I preach the gospel, this is 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 16, and 17, and 18. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory, glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yeah, war unto me if I preach not the gospel. Verse 17, for if I do this thing willingly of my own free will, I have a reward, you see. But if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, I don't receive anything for that, you see, for that attitude about the whole thing. And so it says right here in verse 17, what is my reward? There it is, that word reward again. Then verily that I, when I preach the gospel, I may, I make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my 
uh, power in the gospel. You see, that's why when you jump down to verse 23 and 24, you want to read 24 with 23, and it says, And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Mm. Ye, for ye know that they which run in a race run all. They are all running, but only one is going to receive a prize, so run ye that ye may obtain. So, and he's talking about a prize in the context of a reward based on a performance, you see. And this all coincides with 1 Corinthians chapter uh, uh, 3 again. Let's go to verse uh, 14. It says, If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. And watch what verse 15 says. Because that's powerful what it's about to say. Watch it. If any man's work shall be burned, wood, stubble, and hay, or consumed, he shall suffer loss. He gets no reward for it, you see. And then it says, but he himself shall be saved. Sound like eternal security to me, my friend. Uh, another way of saying eternal security is eternal salvation. Your salvation is eternal. Therefore, it is eternally secured, you see. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yet so as by fire. Let me read that one more time. 1 Corinthians chapter, chapter 3, verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned or consumed like wood, stubble, and hay, amen, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved. Mm. Even though he suffers loss, amen, his work is not rewarded. He himself will be saved. His salvation cannot be lost, my friend. Glory to God in heaven. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Mm, 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 mm. Good stuff right here, my friend. Glory to God. So the word castaway is the same as the word reject. And Paul is referring to this Christian, to his Christian work. Not being accepted by the Lord when he stands before the judgment seat of Christ and not losing his salvation as some have supposed or assumed. You don't ever base an interpretation on scripture on an assumption. And you sure don't take one verse and then build a doctrine on one verse or take one word out of a verse and then assume the meaning. Hmm. Again, your interpretation will be flawed every single time. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Paul is referring to his rights in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Paul is referring to his rights as a Christian minister, both now and in an eternal sense. Amen. Glory to God. And so 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 through 18, again I repeat, note the word reward. Paul is not talking about working for salvation, but he is referring to his Christian work being rejected of the Lord as not being worthy for a reward or rewards. This concerned him, you see. This all speaks to Christian service and not to the Christian's salvation. Amen. And again, the word prize mentioned in verse 24, salvation in no wise is a prize. Again, I repeat, repeat a prize is something you win and not a gift, you see. Amen. Salvation, on the other hand, is a gift according to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. You see, and it's not of it is not of the works of righteousness. It doesn't come by the works of righteousness. Let's look at this, and we'll conclude with this. Uh, Titus uh, three and five. Titus three and five. Titus 3 and 5. Listen to what it says right here. Not of works of righteousness. Not of works of righteousness. Not of works of righteousness. 
which we have done. Anything we can do, my friend, uh, it is it, it could never be deserving of this free gift of grace. Amen. God gives this grace to us out of his mercy. Amen. His mercy and his grace are synonymous. You can't have one without the other. Amen. It is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration. That speaks to John 3 and 3 where Jesus said, Except ye be born of the Spirit, you shall in no wise inherit the kingdom of God or enter into the kingdom of God. Amen. He says, Washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Not, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy has he saved us, my friend. Therefore, one cannot employ uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27, as a passage to teach that a person has to earn his salvation or that a person can lose his salvation. What we have here, again, is a clear case of eisegesis. And again, eisegesis is the approach of to Bible interpretation where the interpreter tries to force the Bible to mean something that fits their existing belief or understanding of a particular issue or doctrine. People who interpret the Bible this way are usually not willing to let the Bible speak for itself and let the chips fall where they may. They start off with the upfront goal of trying to prove a point they already believe in. And everything they read and interpret is filtered through that paradigm. And a paradigm refers to something that is fixed. In other words, they have a preconceived mindset. They have an already established bias or prejudice in their mind. And so when they come to the word of God, they already done decided what it say based on what they believe. And what they do is that they force their belief into passages and make those passages say what they believe rather than come into the passage with an open mind, with a sincere heart, and a humble spirit to be taught, you see. They come to the word like they already got it up, mapped out, worked out, and no and 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 um and figured out. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. And as my dad say, I repeat this again, a preconceived mindset can learn nothing new. Amen. Hallelujah. In other words, they uh employ what the Bible calls private interpretation. Amen. And so that's very important to note. I uh, thank you for watching my video. God bless you. And we will be, deal be dealing with more of these misunderstood verses uh, as we continue to deal with this uh, contrast between eisegesis and exegesis. God bless you and have a good day.